Natalie Hensiker here with a little monochrome painting from my Isaiah's Imagery project. This work explores what the ancient king of Assyria has to do with Columbus Day. Even better, this little study is about how we can find peace and perspective when confronted with incomprehensible tragedies around us, more specifically those caused by power imbalances. Now, I do want to be clear that I have no intention of throwing Columbus under the bus in this video. I have studied his story, and while there are certainly moments <laughs> of really bad choices, there are also sweet moments of redemption. I actually have a soft spot in my heart for him and a spirit of forgiveness for the things that he definitely did get wrong. I also have a soft spot for the pilgrims and natives who, for the most part, genuinely try to get along with each other and live peaceably with each other. Even still, I won't pretend that the story ended well for the vast majority of indigenous people in the Americas. And I am deeply saddened for the things that they had to endure. I can't even imagine what it would have been like. Setting that sadness aside, for just a minute though, here's how the story of the king of Assyria and a belief in a loving God helps me make sense of it all. First, Isaiah begins pointing out that Israel actually isn't following God. <laughs> and God is asking them in verse three, essentially, if you don't follow me, who else are you going to run to for help, okay? Without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners and they shall fall under the slain. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him, meaning the king of Assyria, against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Okay, I know that this sounds pretty brutal. So let me just pause there. If you follow me for long, you'll come to know how I interpret these rebukes much softer than the King James version of the Bible makes them sound in our modern ears. I have a much more in-depth analysis of this for my Justice and Mercy painting, which is currently in the editing process, but I'll put the link in the description below once it's up. Anyway, it will suffice to say here that I do not think that God is an angry God, okay? Like, I don't think that he's waiting to pounce on those who disobey him or that he's intentionally sending brutal dictators to destroy all but a remnant of them. Okay, on the other hand, I actually believe that he expects us to follow him. And when we do follow him, especially as entire nations working together to follow him, we are protected under his power. And when we don't follow him, he can't protect us. So that means that we suffer more than necessary. I also believe that Isaiah himself lived in a dog eat dog kind of Mediterranean world culture. And as a member of this kind of society, he was subject to the cultural trends and comfortably defaulted to condemning, threatening tones because, hey, everyone else spoke in those tones too. Additionally, it was very common for many cultures of the time to believe that the gods controlled literally everything, like wind and war and rain, etc. So the suggestion that Assyria is, is a rod in God's hand, as if Assyria doesn't have a choice and God is like making him do it, may be more of a commentary on ancient cultural perspectives than on the true nature of God. Anyway, I'm not, I'm, I'm just a hundred percent. Okay. <laughs> if you disagree on how literally that I take the Bible, but I think you'll need to understand at least that context so that we can appreciate what Isaiah says next in verse seven. He says, how be it meaning the Assyrian king here meaneth not so neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. That to me means God is definitely not controlling the Assyrian king here. Instead, God was merely willing to allow the king of Assyria to rise to power for a key purpose that Isaiah explains even better in a few more verses that I promise I'll get to in a minute. But the king of Assyria doesn't share God's key purpose. 
No. <laughs> his goal is to use his power to do whatever the heck that he wants to do, which is to destroy and cut off as many nations as he can. So just to give some backdrop to this Assyrian king's arrogance here, let me assure you that it's not just Isaiah pointing this out. Most historians will cite that Assyrians were absolutely brutal dictators. And those historians who aren't so sure that they were all that brutal will still willingly admit that Assyria expected political and religious domination through coercion. What they did was they would ship small groups of conquered nations all over the rest of the empire, just breaking up any potential uprisings by never letting any significant number of like-minded people get together to fight back. Additionally, let me read you just a quick excerpt from Wikipedia. In their worldview, Assyria represented a place of order, while lands not governed by the Assyrian king, and by extension, the god of Asher, were seen as places of chaos and disorder. As such, it was seen as the king's duty to expand the borders of Assyria and bring order and civilization to lands perceived as uncivilized. Sounds like history is repeating itself more than a few times, right? <laughs> but we have to be careful because Wikipedia is only representing a short-term mortal perspective. This is not the end of the story. Isaiah's words in chapter 10, verse 12, are the key to my peace that comes from that eternal heavenly perspective. Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I, the Lord, will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. So three takeaways from that verse. First, God has a purpose in letting Israel and other groups suffer. The purpose is this, to perform his whole work upon his people. So what is God's whole work? In my faith tradition, we have a saying that we often quote, for this is God's work and God's glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Could God be allowing the king of Assyria to inflict suffering because he knows that it just may be the key reason that Israel will repent and turn back to him, or trust him, obey him, and ultimately come closer to immortality and eternal life. I know that suffering has certainly done that for me in my life. Who else has just never prayed like you pray when you are suffering? Second, the king of Assyria will ultimately face the consequences of his choices, and it will be made fair eventually. This is the eternal perspective that I fall in love with. It's one step farther than the mortal perspective that we hear stories about brutal domination on the internet with only tragic endings. Knowing that eventually God will make right all of the pain and persecution that any dictator causes gives me tremendous peace. Knowing that any individuals who happen to be in a position of power will be held accountable for what they did with their power means that I can let go and I can practice forgiveness and grace and love them anyway. But notice here the third and final key that I take from verse 12. Only the king of Assyria himself pays the price of his arrogance. Not every single average Joe Assyrian who happened to share the king's race or religion, or even the poor short-sighted soldiers who fought in his army. God only punishes the brutal leaders who could have used their power for more good in line with his purpose and principles, but these leaders chose not to. I think he holds the followers or the slaves or the mercenaries accountable for their own hearts and not for their leader's heart. And yes, some of them may have shared their leader's arrogance and love of oppressing others, but the rest of them, probably the majority of them, were just doing what they believed that they must do in fear for their own lives. This is why the scripture reminds me again and again that God is a wise judge. 
Yes, he does allow suffering, but he's also willing and able to use that suffering in a way that works his whole work with us, leading us to trust him and lean on his protection and healing instead of cheap substitutes. In the end, it will all be fair and just and right. And each person will be held accountable for their own individual hearts. And that fills me with confidence. In the painting, I actually included some religious symbols of the Assyrian people. This bowl with a man's head and eagle's wings is called a lamasu. So I've heard it called lama, lamasu, but I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that because I hear different things, but we'll go with lamasu. <laughs> While the lamasu is not the head god, who is Asher, who's charged with the role of bringing order to chaos, he was still considered as one, the one given power to protect the people from destruction. The head symbolized intelligence, the bull symbolized strength, and the wings symbolized freedom. He was the Assyrian's hope for strength and deliverance. In so many ways, this mirrors actually what I believe about God the Father and Jesus Christ. And I actually want to rejoice that the Assyrians, I have so many similar beliefs about God. I prefer to focus on what we have in common. But here in the painting, I'm pointing out one key difference that sets my religion apart from theirs. When any religion or political ideology focuses on worldly domination through coercion and the removal of individual freedom, they will eventually fall. In fact, in political science classes, students learn that power is limited. Only one can make it to the top and be the winner. <laughs> They learn that any one winner can only hold that center of power for a short period of time. They can't hold it forever. So I've linked a fascinating speech actually by, given by a political science professor in her last lecture below. But here I will add that you must remember that this power structure is only true in a fallen world. I have included this power structure symbolically in the artwork because ultimately the Lamasu or the Lamasu wasn't able to deliver Assyria. There were actually clear limits on the Lamasu's finite power. His wings have been cut short in the painting because he is looking the wrong way for his strength. And I have him squeezed into this triangle because he actually wasn't able to break free and have enduring power. But to the billions of unnamed people, represented here on the bottom, who have inevitably struggled under the overbearing weight of whatever political power is in control, they still have the option to approach God's divine, limitless power. They are given strength to ascend infinitely. This increase of power has no end point or apex like a triangle does. And the true God is not only a loving, trustworthy protector, but also the only one who can really deliver on the promise of infinite power and protection in the eternal scheme of things. I am so grateful for a God of infinite power, who unlike the Assyrian kings who believe that their head God creates order by domination and control, instead allows us to choose for ourselves and then reap the rewards of whatever our choices are even offering a saving grace when you probably like me have choices that stink <laughs> but we really want to do better so the only thing i'm left to ask myself is am i accepting christ's atoning power to protect and preserve me as an individual am i allowing suffering that i have to endure whether it's a consequence of my own stupid choices or, <laughs> or just the fact that I am human in a fallen world or even part of like my broader nation's choices or my leader's choices. Am I allowing that to refine me and increase my trust in God? Am I refraining from criticism of those in power, trusting that God will make all of their choices, even if they're terrible, work out in the end? Am I at peace? even in the face of unimaginable atrocities of wicked men in positions of power? My answer today is yes. I'm doing my best <laughs> to do all of those things, even if totally imperfectly. And it feels 
really comforting on the now controversial Columbus Day. I'd love it if you'd join me in that place of perspective. If you'd like a reminder to focus on the eternally fair ending more than the present or past mortal suffering, click the link below to purchase the original monochrome or shoot me an email if you want to print. Also, don't forget to check out the fascinating analysis about why I'm so quick to take some of Isaiah's sharp speeches about justice with a grain of salt. As soon as I'm done editing it, you'll see it in the link up here. Until then, happy Columbus Day, happy Indigenous Peoples Day, and happy whatever other day you have stumbled on this video. <laughs> this is your reminder that God's got this all figured out, and thanks to Isaiah for the reassurance. I'll see you next time.